Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you so much for this beautiful Easter morning. We thank you that in the midst of tragedy and uncertainty, death and illness, in the midst of struggle and the violence, that indeed the word of hope and resurrection forever are shouted and acclaimed. We are grateful for your son Jesus who died for us and who now lives for us and reigns for us and is a sign of hope, eternal life, resurrection, new life, and the coming of your kingdom. And so now, God, send your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, that indeed we might open our hearts and minds, our very selves, to what you would say to us today as we celebrate that indeed Christ is risen. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the risen one. Amen. So uh, you may know this about me and you may not know, but I am easily frightened. I just get frightened very easily, and you can scare me pretty easily. In fact, this week, uh, I, I, you know, I have two doors on my office. One goes into the main office, one into the hallway. I had been in the main office. Clayton, our youth pastor, had come in the other door. I didn't know he was in there. I walked in. I screamed like it was the end of the world, right? And if you're on staff or you're around here a lot, you've probably caught me and scared me somewhere in the kitchen or down the hall. And, and I don't just kind of go, oh, I kind of scream and yell like it's the end of the world, amen? Uh, so it's easily frightened. I think it's because I grew up in a household an April Fool's kind of household in which we worked to scare each other all the time. So my brother would hide in the shower, I'd go to take a shower, he would jump out, right? Or, I know, it sounds like a strange family, you're right. Or I would hide under the bed, he would get ready to go to bed, I would grab his ankles, right? Uh, so, yeah, I, a lot of therapy and still not over it, right? Amen, right? Uh, so, so I think that I'm just always on the guard, and sometimes that fear can make me kind of leery and uncertain, and uh, it, it can actually kind of take over. In fact, sometimes I get into that kind of fear where um, I, I'm just afraid of what might happen. Anybody there, you know? So I think, oh, if this happens, then this will probably happen, and then this will happen. Or sometimes I'm just so fearful, I'll just be glad when something's over and I miss the, the, the joy of the moment, right? Like, well, just in five hours this will be over and then I'll be okay, right? Instead of living in it, right? So fear can really... Uh, dominate us, it can direct us, it can keep us from seeing joy, and sometimes fear can actually paralyze us and keep us from moving forward. So, um, it, uh, interesting thing, I, I, several years ago when I was in seminary, some of you know this story, we went on a seminary choir tour, I was in the seminary choir and we sang, and that year we went all over the uh, southwest part of the country, and then we crossed into Mexico and we sang in a few cities. And one of those cities was Monterey, and Monterey has a Methodist seminary and Wesley Methodist Church. We spent a couple of days there. And so the night before the concert, uh, we'd been there in the country several days. We, um, we just decided to do a lot more tourism that day. But frankly, by lunch, we were hungry, and we were kind of tired of the local fare. Uh, so we went to my favorite banquet restaurant, Kentucky Fried Chicken, okay? And I didn't know they existed in Mexico, but they do. And the menu board was all in Spanish. Now, I'm not fluent in Spanish. I'm not very good at it at all. And so I was really nervous, maybe frightened about making this order. And so I had my roommate on the trip, Steve, who was fluent in Spanish, stand next to me while I placed the order. And he kept saying, James, it's not that hard because you just read it from the board, right? But you know what it's like when you're afraid. You just get anxious, right? So I was just a little nervous and frightened and I read it, and I got the order in, and Steve went to go sit down, and then the woman, who was very pleasant and wonderful, said something, and I couldn't understand it. And she said it again, and then I got panicked. And then she said it again, and I got frightened, and then I got nervous, and then I thought, it's not going to happen. Then I escalated. I know you never do that, but I do, right? And so I turned around in the restaurant and rather loudly said, Steve, get up here and help me. And so he runs up thinking the end of the world has come, right? And so he comes and he wants to, she's saying something, and I can't understand it. And she said it again so beautifully, and he just began to laugh, and he said, James, she's saying in English, extra crispy or original, okay? <laughs> Sometimes when we're afraid, we miss, Right? Sometimes when we're full of fear, we can't see an act of hospitality. Sometimes when we're so fearful of the world 
or fearful of others or just living in fear and dread, we can't see the possibility of hope. Amen? Amen. So today's story is a beautiful story from the Gospel of Mark, one of the four Gospels, Gospel meaning good news. And frankly, it's my least favorite on Easter Sunday. In fact, I love John because John's a longer, more detailed story, and Jesus has this beautiful moment with Mary Magdalene. She thinks he's a gardener, and then he reveals himself to her. Do you know that story? It's beautiful. Luke has this great story as well of two uh, angels appearing and giving a lot more direction. Matthew's story is beautiful as well, but Mark's is very brief and to the point. Now, we remember from last week, if you were here, we talked about the Gospel of Mark. Remember Uh, Many scholars believe it was the first one written down, probably around 70 A.D., after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem by the Romans. So it was written in the context of great destruction and uncertainty. We believe that Mark probably wrote it, uh, taking the stories of Jesus and the, the witnesses of Jesus and putting them together for the church in Rome, the early church in Rome, which was under persecution. Remember Nero had falsely accused the Christians of burning the city, and so they were being killed and persecuted for their faith. Some believe maybe it was sent first to Syria, uh, to the church at Syria, who was also under persecution. But Mark is much briefer. He has less words. There's not a lot of detail. But when there is detail, pay attention. You probably also know that the scholars, in the, when they find the original, original, the earliest manuscripts of Mark, find only the first eight verses. Then later in the 4th century, someone took some of the parts of Matthew and Luke and added them in, as you heard Allison read today. But we're not sure. Some scholars think maybe the ending of Mark was lost. Others think Mark intentionally left it brief and ended it the way he did for a purpose. But whatever the case, it's a very brief account of the resurrection of Jesus. Hear it. So, when the Sabbath was over, that would have been Friday evening through Saturday, So sunset on Saturday, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices, and they were going to do what they needed to do the day Jesus died, but couldn't. They were going to anoint his dead body. You remember Jesus died uh, right before the Sabbath, and the chief priest did not want him to remain on the cross, and so in the end they were brought down quickly, and Joseph of Arimathea offered a tomb, and Jesus was buried quickly, and a stone was rolled in front of that tomb. And this may be what it looked like, the stone being a large, uh, kind of centrical-looking piece, a cylinder. Whatever the case, they have bought these spices to do what would honor Jesus, which was the tradition of anointing the body. So very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, which would have been Sunday, when the sun had already risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? I find that interesting. So the whole journey, maybe that night as they gathered things together after the Sabbath was over, who's going to roll that big stone away? Who, who's going to roll that stone away? They didn't have a project manager on the job, amen? No one had thought through the goals of getting this done. So maybe they thought somebody would just be there and help them. When they looked up, they saw that the stone, and this is an important detail from Mark, it's very clear, which was very, very large. So that's important. Mark wants us to know the stone's large. It's not easily moved. People could not have stolen the body. This is important for Mark to reveal this part of the story to us. The stone was very large, but it had already been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Of course they were, right? If you went to the cemetery to visit relatives and somebody in dazzling white began to speak to you, your life is going to be changed, right? We know that's our lesson here. All the time at Kingswood, if somebody appears in dazzling white, your life will be changed. So this angel, most likely, on the right side, just like Jesus, has appeared to them and tells them not to be afraid. And he says, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He gives us a brief word of the history of Jesus' salvation history. He has been raised and he is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. Another detail. Mark wants us to know that it's not that just Jesus isn't here, but this is the place where he was laid and there is not a body there now. Amen? Amen. 
Then he says to them, go. It's interesting. Go, tell his disciples and Peter. Now, that's another detail. He singles out Peter. Why? Because Peter was the disciple, if you'll remember, early in the story of Holy Week and of the betrayal of Jesus and the crucifixion, who said, I will stay with you forever, Jesus. I will never leave you. I will die with you. I am with you to the end. And then he's the very one who deserts him. Remember, three denials, cock crows, he disappears. Mark wants us to know that the angel was clear to say that Peter singled out as a sign of redemption and grace. The angel says, Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee where all of this started, and there you shall see him just as Jesus told you. So the women went out and they fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Now, I don't know about you, but that bothers me a little bit. Like, you know, Jesus is risen from the dead. The women have witnessed a messenger. They've been told to go to Galilee and tell the disciples. I mean, this is an amazing thing, but we're on the other side, right? We know the whole story. They were in the midst of grief. They had seen the death of Jesus. They had seriously suffered. They had seen the injustice. They had seen the crucifixion. So it was hard for them to even imagine. And then to be frightened and to live in terror and to be uncertain about their future They just went away in terror and told no one. Now later, in the verses you heard read, eventually Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, and then, of course, the story of Emmaus and the two that encountered the risen Christ. But there's some reason Mark leaves us on this edge, this place where we are waiting, right? I think Mark does this intentionally. You know why? Because I think Mark wants to put the story of the resurrection of Jesus in our lap and say, how will you live this out? Will you live in terror? Will you live in fear? Will you hold the good news of Christ's resurrection? Or will you go and tell? And will you share and change? And will your life be resurrected? And will the world be transformed by the hope of Christ? Amen? I think Mark does it for a persecuted church and does it for us today to say it rests with you. How will you embrace resurrection? But it's hard. When we're in fear or uncertainty, when we're challenged, when we live in a world of such violence, it's easier for us to look inward and withdraw, amen, than to share the good news that Christ is risen. I've said this story before. Several, several years ago, when my mother was diagnosed with a non-malignant brain tumor, our life changed. I went to Texas. My brother came My sister came, and there we spent a couple of days with my mom as she prepared for surgery. It was a hard time for us. We had not expected it. It happened so fast. We were were kind of lost and uncertain. Their pastor was with us. He was great. He was supportive. But we were all nervous and fearful. The day came, and of course, everyone was there. You know how this is, cousins and friends. And so we were kind of overwhelmed with hosting people. You know how that is, right? If you've ever had somebody in the hospital, you spend all your time kind of taking care of other people. But it was a good distraction. The surgery went as well as it could. My mom did okay. And she came out of surgery and we were all there. And it was, a, it was really a, a good moment. And we were thankful to God for the way that it had gone. Everything wasn't perfect, but we were grateful. The first day, that day, things went fairly well. And that night, My brother went home because he needed to travel to his home the next day. My sister took my dad, and they decided to rest, and and, and we all kind of left, and my sister then decided to come back and stay with my mom. When we went back the next day, she wasn't doing very well. In fact, things had taken a difficult turn. She wasn't responding well. She was in a lot of pain. Uh, The doctor was concerned. We had really no idea what was going to happen. The whole day was just one of those days of dread and uncertainty. Anybody been there? When it came time the evening after supper, my dad was exhausted, so my sister and brother took him home. My brother decided to stay an extra day, and I decided I would spend the night with my mom. And so they had one of those sofas that turns into a bed, you know what I'm saying? And I got a pillow, and I moved it near my mother, and I laid down... And I just heard her through the night struggling and in pain. 
It was a difficult night. It seemed like it would never be over. But early in the morning, you know that time in the morning when the sun just begins to start to rise, the sky is kind of blue and the blue comes through the windows. It was just beginning to brighten in the room. I heard a voice. It was my mom's voice. It was weak, but it was clear. She said, I think I'm going to be okay. I think I'm going to be okay. I think I'm going to be okay. And I held her hand, and, you know, everything didn't come together immediately, and there were still challenges that came with all the rehab, but in that moment, I just remember her saying, I think I'm going to be okay. And I just sat there with her and held her hand for a long time. I didn't call my dad. I didn't call my sister or brother. I didn't call anybody. My sister calls about an hour later. How's mom? We're so worried. We're about to head down. How's it going? I said, oh, she says she's going to be okay. My sister says, what's wrong with you, right? Why didn't you call us? And I wondered about that. Why in the midst of that miracle could I not immediately, filled with joy, call my sister and say, mom says she's going to be okay because I was afraid. It was hard to take it all in. Was this for real? Was this going to happen? Was this going to transform her life? Was she going to be okay? But she was. So I kind of get where the women are today, right? Resurrection's kind of messy and challenging in a world that claims order and certainty. Amen? Resurrection says that in the midst of violence and school violence and and, and in the midst of brokenness and relationships and the destruction of people and civil war, that hope is a possibility. That sounds crazy. And so I can get where they were reluctant, but I'm grateful that at the end, disciples finally began to proclaim the good news and Jesus appeared to them and said, indeed, he is risen. Mark, I think, wrote this story perfectly for us. Because it's not somebody else's story, it's our story. It's the story of our faith. And so Mark puts it in our lap and says, what will you do with this? How will you live this? Will you live in fear or will you live as resurrection people? Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. So we're about to go back into this world, amen? And at least after Easter brunch, we will return to the reality of the world, amen? The brokenness, the uncertainty, people in need, people struggling, poverty, violence, fears for our children and our schools, amen? What will you do with this message? Will you hold it? Will you live in fear? Will you be startled and afraid, and and will you just remain there? Or will you truly live as resurrection people? Will you receive the good word that Christ is risen, and will your life and the lives of those you touch be forever changed? Amen? So I challenge us, myself and you, to go forth from this place and not to live in fear or uncertainty, not to hold on to this good news. It's amazing news. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Christ is risen.